Hello, I'm Helen King from the Open University and I'm going to talk today about dissection and imaging. In the last video, we saw an image of a whole body votive from the ancient Mediterranean. How was knowledge of the inside of the body, the hidden inside of the body, gained in earliest times? Some knowledge could come from butchery or from sacrifice, knowledge of animal bodies at least, because those two were really close. The sacrificed meat could then become what was sold by the butcher. History very rarely travels in a straight line and the history of dissection is no exception to that. In Western Europe, the history of dissection starts and stops and then starts again. Dissection in the ancient world is often associated with ancient Egypt where bodies were opened up and organs removed as part of the mummification process. But that was opening up human bodies for religious purposes, not for the purpose of gaining medical knowledge. For that, for gaining medical knowledge, the first two names associated with human dissection are Hierophilus and Erisistratus. They lived in the third century BC and worked in Alexandria in Egypt. They're often shown together, almost like a double act, as in this 16th century woodcut. They're both holding their books, but of course we don't have those books anymore. They've been lost. We have to rely on people who read those books while they were still available, who summarised them or quote from them. Working in Egypt, in Alexandria, Herophilus and Erisistratus were under the patronage of the Ptolemies, the kings of Egypt. It was a monarchy, so what the king said was okay. This may have helped to overcome long-standing taboos. The bodies they used were provided by the state from prisoners who were already down for execution. Again, in the history of dissection, the use of prisoners has a very, very long history. One later critic of Herophilus and Erisistratus called Herophilus a butcher, which is ironic when you think of the connections between knowledge of the body from butchery and from anatomy. Another critic of Herophilus and Erisistratus in the first century AD was Celsus, who argued that cutting up bodies was basically cruel, but could be acceptable if it was done to help other people. Nevertheless, nothing really stuck. Human dissection came and went, and to us what's surprising is that after it being used, it was so rapidly abandoned. Perhaps simply because knowing about the anatomy of dead bodies wasn't perceived to be particularly useful in helping living people. And then there's Galen, the great second century AD doctor and prolific writer. He didn't dissect humans, it was not allowed, but he did enthusiastically dissect animals. And he wasn't averse to a little bit of human dissection if he came across a body rotting by the roadside or if he happened to visit tombs. He knew that human bodies were important, but he thought you could get a lot from animal bodies. And we know that he obtained his ox brains for dissection from a butcher, a great medicine and butchery connection. Why ox brains? Because Galen was studying human brains and he couldn't get any. So he thought if you studied the ox brain, that was good enough. And he asked the butchers to make sure there wasn't too much bone stuck on the brain when he bought them. So really quite a tailored um, butchery connection there. The other reason why Galen was dissecting ox brains was to improve his skill as a dissector. Dissection in the second century AD could be a very public event, all about star performers wowing their audience, and Galen was superb at this. Galen could also carry out accidental dissection, which is when someone's had a really serious wound and you can see inside the body through that wound. Galen was doctor for some of his career to the gladiators, so he understood about how wounds could be quite a useful way of seeing inside the body. Human dissection came onto the formal medical curriculum much later than we might expect. In the Middle Ages, autopsies were performed on people who had a reputation for saintliness. The idea was that if their internal organs were abnormal in some way, that was a sign that they were special, that they were different. But of course, for that, you needed to know what a normal organ looked like. 14th century manuscripts show dissection in progress, but it's quite basic. What's seen, what's found, 
what's described really doesn't seem particularly amazing to us. And then we come to an unusual image, a very famous image from what's called the Welcome Apocalypse. It's a manuscript from about 1420 produced in Germany. It includes the Apocalypse of St. John, as well as a treatise on how to die well. And it shows what's called the diseased woman. The diseased woman used to be criticized as showing that really people hadn't got a clue what was going on inside the body. But I think that misses the point. The diseased woman is an attempt to show in two dimensions something which exists in three, and that's always a challenge. So the diseased woman has her organs displayed, but not exactly where they really are. So, for example, the womb is over to the far right of the image. And we know the woman is pregnant because the word embryo has been written on the womb. The womb is so far from the cervix that it's clearly crazy. But in order to show it in two dimensions, it has to be spread out, separated from the other organs that otherwise would obscure it. The picture also includes images of wombs showing various positions in which the fetus can present. This continues the series which started on the previous page of the manuscript. And all around the images, there are Latin texts describing what can happen within the body. Some of this is very, very general. It's not just about women. So things like swollen feet or bad breath, as well as conditions that affect women, such as a closed up womb. Monica Green has proposed that this image is showing the investment made by a cleric in bringing together texts on diseases of women and texts on pregnancy. And that that might be not just about improving that owner's knowledge, but also presenting that knowledge to other groups, particularly midwives. So it could be used in, in educating them too. As well as the diseased women, there are various images of people consulting practitioners, people consulting doctors, and there's lots of remedies all through the text. About 70 years after this image was produced, Leonardo da Vinci, who was then about 40 years old, produced this extraordinary image of a couple having sex. It's just in a different league. It's part of a notebook, uh, which is held in the Queen's collection at Windsor Castle. It's a pen and ink drawing, and typically for Leonardo's notebooks, it includes lots of different ideas whizzing around the page. Uh, but the biggest image of all on this page is this couple. Leonardo has imagined what it might be like to cut a, a couple in half while they're actually in the act of sex. There's a man and a woman, but if I say a man and a woman, that's a little bit misleading because actually the man is the dominant character here. The woman is just a few fleeting bits of organ. She's got a womb, she's got a bottom, she's got a breast, she's got a spinal cord, but that's about it for her. The man is in much more detail. He's got heart and lungs, he's got a stomach, intestines, even a head and a face. He's a person. She's hardly there at all. When you first look at this, you think what an extraordinary and detailed image this is and how accurate it looks, but it's not. The most extraordinary thing about this image is that Leonardo did it before he actually did any human dissection. It's probably about 15 years after he drew this that he first had access to actual human remains. So this drawing is from Leonardo's imagination. It's an imagination that's been informed by various other things. For example, theories which go back to ancient Greek medicine and to medieval medicine. So if you look closely, you can see a channel connecting the woman's breast, her nipple, to her womb. That's from the idea that menstrual blood is converted into milk and travels to the breast to come out. The womb itself is very bumpy looking. It may be an attempt to show a medieval view of the womb in which it had seven chambers, um, three on each side, and then one in the middle from which hermaphrodites came. It was all to do with the gender of the child, not just its sex. Leonardo also has the womb drawing up the seed from the male penis. This is part of a medieval view that 
the womb was active, that it actually took part in sex as an active partner, pulling seed rather than just waiting passively to receive seed. This image looks so much more accurate than anything we've seen here. But remember, it's not. It's part of Leonardo's imagination. It's based on his knowledge of the body from the outside. And in order to go further into the body, we need to do dissection, which he hadn't at that stage done. In the next instalment, I'll be looking further at the long tradition of using the imagination in understanding the inside of the body. Thank you.